ありがとうございました。Uh, well, seems、uh, in the middle, I think Otamoko san has a really good timekeeping. So, our next guest is still not here. So, <laughs> I have some time to. Yeah, I just get these brief notes from my volunteers. So, probably you have, all of you have get a little ticket. And when you come in, our volunteers have distributed. So, this is the house rule of this place. So, yeah, you have to have the tickets to get in. Otherwise, they will kick you out. No, no, there is ushers who will, 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 will very politely to. to, to To, to stay away, ask you to stay away. So I have to remind you, you always bring your tickets as we advise you that you must bring your passport on the street. And, and the ticket is not replaceable and cannot be reissued. I just read the notes, so it sounds not like me. And, and the one ticket for, entry, for all entries to JCA, so every session here, you must have the tickets, and including. Here, you've already gone in the opening and the closing, and the, the keynote speeches tomorrow and, yeah, and later. And, yeah, and all the, all the sessions. And if lost, nobody will kick you out, I'm sure. You, you, just, you have to wait outside until all the, all the people with tickets come in, and then if there's empty spaces, obviously there's a lot of upstairs, and then you can come in. So, Uh, yeah, so that's a very important message, so you must remember it. And here is a little bit, yeah, after this honorable guest, and we have a press conference, so if you are a member of the press,、uh, please remain seated. Yeah, 講多話講一次啦，咁喺呢一個突然間某位重要人物講完嘢之後咧，就有個 press con 嘅。咁假如大家要誒係呢一個嚟自某一個媒體嘅話咧，咁突然間可以坐低嘅，咁咧咁其他人咧就就喺講即係講完呢、這個聽完呢個演講之後咧，就係啦，就可以出去噶啦。咁跟住咧 ，Now the one and only Jimmy Wells。Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm not sure what he meant that I wasn't here yet. I was sitting in the front row, but that's completely fine.、Um, so, very good. Why don't you finish taking pictures and all go sit down? It'll be more fun. Okay. So,、uh, good morning and welcome to Wikimania Hong Kong. Yay! So, for those of you who've been to uh, more than one uh, Wikimania, uh, you'll know I normally traditionally、uh, do a thing where I get people,、uh, everybody to stand up and then sit down one by one、uh, in groups, depending on what year you started editing or, or whatever. And somebody suggested to me last year that I should do it in the reverse order.、Um, and so that's what I'm going to do, just to get everybody、uh, standing up、uh, early again. Uh, to make sure that you're awake, although the,、uh, the lions definitely woke us up this morning. So, this time I'm going to do it a little bit differently. And、uh, my first question here is how many people have been to at least nine Wikimanias? Nine Wikimanias. Woo! We actually, as I understand,、uh, I tried with、uh, someone to do the count last night. I think there are four people who、uh, this year missed Wikimania for the first time. So the group is getting smaller and smaller every year. But how many have been to at least eight? There we go. Seven. Here they come. Oh, seven. Matthias, I, you were here at the first one. And Minnie, you must have missed a couple. With the babies, yeah. <laughs> Six? 
At least six, at least six. You're not allowed to sit down. At least five. At least four. At least three. Woo! That's pretty good. That's, I think that's about half the room has been to at least three. At least two Wikimanias. And how many people have been to at least one? That's, <laughs> you'd best all be standing. Woo! So really, uh, the point of all this is uh, if you can remember a few of those people who've been around for a very long time, um, or if, you, if this is your first Wikimania, which it looked like a little bit less than half of the people, which is pretty impressive, um, look around in people who've been around before and uh, meet people um, and get to know people. And those of you who you noticed you were sitting next to one, uh, someone who's new, uh, make sure to greet them and uh, uh, you know, invite them to come to sessions uh, with you and, and tell them what you know. So the, um, uh, the thing that I want to talk about uh, today, I always like to, to give uh, a brief address every year at Wikimania uh, called uh, State of the Wiki, and a lot of this is uh, quite traditional. Um, and it basically is to help us all reflect on the original uh, vision for Wikipedia, which is for all of us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Um, we're the people who are doing that, and um, every year we keep cranking along and, and working and working. And I think Wikimania is a great time to stop and reflect on uh, the successes that we've had so far. Um, and so I wanted to go through uh, quickly just some of our milestones this year. Um, when you've been at it as long as we all have uh, now, over 12 years, um, it's easy to get a bit uh, jaded about certain milestones, uh, but to me they're still very, very exciting. Uh, when we look at the big numbers, uh, 28 million articles, uh, 286 editions, uh, well that's a nice big number, but it's almost too big to contemplate, and certainly none of us is working in a project uh, where the number 28 million has direct relevance to us, it's not something that we try to achieve. Uh, but what's interesting to me is the, the breakdown of languages uh, that have different, you know, major milestones. So we now have 120 languages uh, with at least 1,000 articles. And obviously, uh, those, uh, you know, those last 20 languages are all just barely over 1,000 articles. And what I would encourage people to do is to go out there and find those, uh, find those wikis. Uh, go to the list of Wikipedias uh, and go see who's working there and, and meet them. Uh, come out of your home wiki where you're used to, to working and maybe uh, at a moment when you're discouraged about some, uh, you know, of our usual uh, idiotic arguments that we all accidentally find ourselves in as Wikipedians, uh, go do something completely different. Go pick a language that you know very little about, um, hopefully uh, a language, uh, a regional language in your area where they may speak your language, um, and go and try and find one, someone there who speaks your language. English is al always a, a likely choice, but depending on the part of the world, it might be French, it might be Russian, it might be something else entirely. Um, and just go and chat with them and ask them how they're doing and ask them how you can help them and say, I'm sorry I don't speak your language at all, um, but I would love to spread the word and help you in whatever way I can. Um, and it's an incredibly rewarding thing to do, to go and meet those people who are just at the beginning uh, of that journey. Uh, we now have 46 languages with at least 10,000 articles, and that's, that's good. 46, you know, uh, uh, you know, once a wiki has uh, 10,000 articles, that's a good community. Uh, they're normally working very hard, and they're starting to think in big ways and starting to get really excited. Although sometimes they can say, gosh, we've been working for so many years, we're getting discouraged. Uh, we're only at 10,000 articles, but that is, again, a great opportunity uh, for outreach. Go and, and tell them, particularly if you're an old-timer, say, well, I remember when English Wikipedia was only 10,000 articles, and here's what we did. Um, and then the big news for this year, this is actually, this number has really, um, has changed dramatically this year, and this is a number that doesn't change dramatically most years. We now have eight languages uh, with at least one million articles, um, and that's an astonishing thing. Uh, and it's such an astonishing thing, I'm going to take uh, uh, just a few minutes uh, to, to celebrate it. Uh, by looking at, at each one of them in turn. Uh, so first of all, we had uh, in January, Italian uh, passed one million. So I'd like all the Italians to stand up.
Stand up, Italians. We've got a few here. Woo! Um, another big milestone is uh, the Russian Wikipedia. I'd like the Russians to stand up. Very good. And as you know, if you've been watching um, uh, the, all the news around uh, SOPA, PIPA, internet struggles, uh, both the Italian and the Russian Wikipedias um, have had some successes and, and some struggles uh, with political considerations and factors. And the Russians in particular, I think, are facing uh, a fairly difficult internet environment these days. Uh, there are a lot of legislative threats and things like this, and so um, I encourage them to keep up the good work, and I encourage all the rest of us uh, to offer to help as much as we can. Uh, I think it's really important across all the languages that we all maintain uh, a vigil uh, and a look at what's going on in every place around the world where people are having trouble uh, sharing knowledge with everyone, even if it doesn't apply to you and your country, um, well, you never know when it will. Um, and that's true, um, as we've learned this year, even for Americans who can be quite complacent about freedom of speech issues. Um, it's very important for all of us to be aware of what's going on. Uh, next language, Spanish. <laughs> All right. And then uh, a language where I, I think it's a, it's a little bit unfair because there's just, there's so many of them uh, that it's no wonder that they wrote so many articles. The Swedes. <laughs> the Swedish have reached a million articles. I'm joking, of course, but it is, uh, of course, uh, um, it is very impressive uh, when we see the languages that don't have a huge number of speakers um, who are incredibly active uh, in Wikipedia. My, my theory has always been that it's the cold Swedish winters uh, that help us to do so well there, but um, the truth is that's just a joke. And uh, in fact, it's about really dedicated volunteers uh, really pouring their hearts into the project. Um, another uh, funny little milestone this year, I, I actually had not uh, noticed this. Somehow when this news came out, I completely missed it. I did not realize uh, that there has now been an asteroid named after Wikipedia. 274301 Wikipedia. It's amazing. Yeah, so apparently... Uh, when they, when they first discovered it, they thought it was in, in, in one place, and then another scientist said, no, it's in another place, and then, no, th no, this place. They had a big debate, and they, they finally settled on where it was, and they called it Wikipedia, so. Uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about is um, a little bit of news about the foundation. I'm not gonna go into a lot about this, uh, simply because there are other people here. Sue is gonna give her talk, lots of people to talk. Uh, more about the foundation, but I did want to uh, take the opportunity to, to cheat a little bit since I'm uh, the first speaker from the foundation uh, to announce some very important news. As many of you may have heard, um, the Queen uh, Beatrix of the Netherlands um, has stepped down um, and is no longer the Queen of the Netherlands, and uh, I'm here to welcome our new Dutch king, <laughs> Jan Bart. Jan Bart. I think, I think, I tried to find a matching picture. I think the dress suits her better than you. But uh, anyway, Jan Bart, uh, congratulations to Jan Bart. He's a very long standing uh, board member and he was just uh, elected uh, to be the chair of the board of the Wikimedia Foundation for the upcoming year, uh, which is fabulous and very exciting. Uh, and something that uh, I'm very pleased to talk about. So I, I spoke earlier about um, uh, the, the difficulties that people have in different uh, environments uh, relating to freedom of speech. And of course, um, we're all very aware of the difficulties that uh, Chinese language Wikipedia had for many years. For many, many years, uh, of course, Wikipedia was completely banned in mainland China. Uh, and then now, 
For several years, we've been broadly accessible in mainland China, uh, but with certain pages blocked and filtered. Um, and there's always a constant threat in China of uh, censorship. Uh, and that's something that we all have to struggle with. And there are many other jurisdictions around the world where this is an issue, uh, where governments, for whatever reasons, uh, may be uncomfortable with uh, the, the very concept of the free sharing of knowledge. Um, and in many cases, it's, it's not just about particular pieces of knowledge, uh, although that's important to them, that certain information they don't want people to know about. It's also the much deeper principle, the deeper principle that access to participation in the creation of the human story um, is a human right. It's for all of us. It's not for to be dictated to us top down by legal authorities, that we all have the opportunity and the, and the right to participate in that kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's very easy, I think, um, all around the world to become complacent um, if you live in a jurisdiction where you think, uh, well, we don't have those problems here. Fortunately, we don't. Um, and one example of this uh, came around this year. Uh, this was an entry in the French Wikipedia. Woohoo! Um, which, uh, in English, I have to switch to English, I can't read French. Uh, it's the Pierre Surhaut military radio station. Um, and if you hadn't heard the story, what happened was um, a, uh, a Wikipedian was called into the office, I hope I tell the story correctly, and was uh, basically demanded uh, on the spot to delete the article. Apparently, the article um, allegedly contained uh, some top secret information, and it was a, a threat because it's a military radio station and it revealed the location of it. Um, as it turned out, um, the, the article was very well referenced, and uh, the information originally apparently had gone public when the uh, uh, the fellow who was in charge of the radio station brought a TV crew in to show them around. Um, you know, not exactly. Uh, and, and the article had existed uh, for several years. And I, I tried to go back and check all of the different uh, versions of Wikipedia. I couldn't, I can't say with 100% certainty, but as far as I was able to tell, uh, before this incident, this fairly obscure military radio station, uh, it had been a very stable, kind of a dull, you know, you know the type of article. It's a dull article about a radio tower. It's not that exciting. Um, had only existed in the French Wikipedia. Um, today, the article exists in <laughs> 29 languages. Um, suggesting to me that perhaps this wasn't actually the work of uh, a very stupid person uh, in, the, in the security services, but actually a very clever person in the local tourism promotion department <laughs> uh, who has now gotten a local landmark uh, into 29 languages. Um, and so anyway, the, the fellow who uh, uh, had to, to deal with this, uh, Remy, uh, is Remy here? I know I should know these things. Uh, I don't, he's not here. Pardon? Christoph is here. Well, I, I, okay, well, good. Where's Christoph? Okay, is, is there anyone here who is either from France or has heard of France? I think, um, anyway, the point is, um, every year, one of my uh, personal traditions is to name someone uh, as Wikipedian of the year, and my person I'm naming this year is Remy, uh, for, for having to put up with this nonsense, um, essentially. Um, so what happened is he was there uh, in the office and they said, you better delete this now or we're going to arrest you. Um, being uh, a, a very courageous and yet wise Wikipedian, he said, delete, uh, knowing full well what would happen when he got home and, and sort of got online and told everybody what happened, which is it was undeleted um, almost instantly. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, it became quite a, a press story, and a press story that was uh, very, you know, completely positive for us and completely negative. There was nothing about uh, the article that was bad. It was just a really uh, stupid thing. Um, but what it brings me to, and this is really the, the substance of some things that I wanted to talk about today, um, is, is the question of journalism. Um, and what is going on today with journalism um, and what our role as Wikipedians is, and of course Wikinews is a, is a piece of this, um, in journalism. Uh, we live in a very interesting era. Uh, we live in the area of Snowden and Assange and so on, 
uh, an area when all kinds of information that people would prefer to remain secret or private is being exposed. Uh, this, of course, brings up a, a great many very complicated philosophical issues. Uh, there are a lot of these issues that we are very fortunate as a community that we don't actually have to confront directly. Uh, because we are an encyclopedia and we rely on reliable published sources, um, we're not the right place to go if people have information they want to leak. At the same time, that doesn't mean that this has nothing to do with us, that all of this is going on uh, and has absolutely nothing to do with us and with our ethics and with our view of the world and what sharing knowledge should be like and what the world should be like. Um, and so if we take a look at, at Snowden, um, as a particular example, Edward Snowden, um, who unfortunately is not in Hong Kong anymore. I was hoping that we might have him uh, up here. Um, I did try to get in touch with him, but it's very hard to get in touch with Edward Snowden, as it turns out. Um, well, he has leaked uh, important information, and it's really changing uh, the way that people think about surveillance. Um, a lot of uh, what he has leaked uh, recently um, has caused me to have a really serious rethink about uh, security online uh, and things, uh, you know, that that you. In, in theory, you know, I'm sure there are people in this room who are really, you know, cryptography geeks, and I love cryptography geeks, um, and people who are really passionate about it, but the truth is I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm more of your normal lazy consumer, so if you ask me in principle, would I like all my email to be PGP encrypted, I say yes, and then I spend about 15 minutes trying to get it installed and working, and I say, well, I'll work on that tomorrow. Um, um, but one of the things that I'm, I'm very excited about, um, as this has begun to happen and we realize that the NSA has developed capabilities um, that are far beyond what I had ever imagined, um, I didn't really realize how big their budget is. Uh, their budget's about $8 billion a year. You can buy a lot of servers for $8 billion a year, and uh, they're basically snooping on far more traffic than we ever would have imagined. Uh, they have, uh, you know, certain rules like, um, you know, for American citizens, they're not allowed to spy on you unless you happen to be talking to a foreigner. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that of all the Americans in this room, uh, you've probably all talked to a foreigner at some point in the last year. Um, it's not that uncommon anymore. Uh, and so, uh, one of the things that I'm really happy about, and I'm really proud of the uh, Wikimedia Foundation and of the tech staff, uh, is that we're moving to SSL. It's been on the roadmap for a long time. There's a really great blog post on the Wikimedia blog, if you haven't read it, uh, talking about those plans, talking about the challenges. Uh, certainly since I started talking about this publicly, uh, the reaction's been very interesting from just random uh, people on Twitter. Uh, it ranges from, um, you're completely lazy morons, why don't you just turn it on? Um, which, uh, if you know anything about uh, running a website with uh, 500 million visitors a month, it's not as easy as just turn it on. Um, to, well, that's completely useless. Um, SSL is completely worthless and broken and it doesn't help at all. The truth, of course, is incredibly complicated and somewhere in the middle. Um, where I come down is that uh, we, are, we are in a move towards more encryption across the entire internet for perfectly good reasons, uh, and governments are actually of two minds about this. On the one hand, um, they love to worry about, and quite appropriately, uh, genuine issues of cybersecurity. I mean, we live in an era when credit card numbers get stolen, uh, you know, real mafia gangs of people are doing really bad things online. Um, and so that part of the government will say, yes, we need more encryption, we need everything to be secure. Um, and the part that wants to spy on everybody wants us to not use it so much. Um, and I believe one of the tools that they use to, to encourage people to not use encryption, uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security just put out this incredibly alarming uh, notice just a few days ago about a particular new attack on SSL. And if you read it as a person who's familiar with technology, you would say, you know, what's interesting about it is it's technically correct what they're saying, but the way it's written, um, if you step back and you think about, um, when I step back and I think about my mother reading it, my mother would read this and say, wow, I know when it says HTTPS, that's supposed to be safe, but apparently it's completely not safe. So I'm not going to bother. I don't worry about it anymore because I just assume everything is public. I think that there is a motivation amongst the, the, the spies to encourage people to think that encryption is completely useless, that it's broken, and there's no reason to bother using it. Um, I don't think that's true, and I think that we should really be pushing uh, in our personal communications uh, with as many websites as we use, um, 
to let's go to as much security as possible uh, for as long as we can. And, and you know, for, for many people, it's like, well, I understand why it's important that my bank details are secret, but why is it important that what I'm reading at Wikipedia is secret? And the truth is, for most of us, it doesn't matter that much. For me, the, the principle is what, what is at issue here, is the principle that any time something happens, is the government going to start trawling through everybody's uh, surfing history to understand what you've been reading? And to me, there's something really deeply wrong with that. Even if you believe, as I do, uh, that if they've got a good reason and they go to a judge and they ask for an order that they should be able to get access to the information, that's very different from saying we want to be able to spy on everybody all the time for any reason whatsoever. So I'm really excited about uh, the possibility of moving to more encryption, but what's really interesting to me and, and what I really want to talk about is the media, is journalism around this. So what I've just now talked about is some complicated issues about SSL, and I'm not even the most qualified person to do it. Um, we've got loads of people who are genuine cryptography geeks, and we've got developers and people like this who could really tell you interesting, deep stories. It, it's been a lot of work for me to be able to talk about encryption uh, and security in a coherent way for a general audience. And the reason for that is the media is not doing that job for us. Uh, th this is really one of the greatest journalistic opportunities of the century, of, of last century as well. That we live in an era when the possibility to uncover wrongdoing, uh, the possibility for, you know, in the past you might have had a disgruntled uh, employee who, who knew about some crime being committed and they come out of a situation and they tell a reporter, yes, they're committing crimes there, but they have no way to prove it. Today, more often than not, they have a way to prove it. They can, they can get some documents and prove it. So for journalists, this is a huge opportunity, and it's a chance to live up to the rightful mission of the press. Uh, but instead, instead of getting explanations about SSL, and, I, and, and believe me, you may have a skewed view of it, but I really want you to, th to step back and think about it, because you may be thinking, no, no, I read this really great article on, uh, uh, you know, such and such uh, on Ars Technica. Yeah, but nobody's reading Ars Technica except us geeks, right? You won't read a good article about any of this stuff in USA Today or CNN um, or even the BBC, which is a great uh, journalistic enterprise. Uh, so we do get some really great journalism, but we get a lot more crap. Seriously, a lot more crap. Let me just show you one tiny example, and this is really, it's just one little thing, but it's a thing that has really bugged me. Uh, we've got Edward Snowden, who, love him or hate him, I think he's awesome, um, love him or hate him, uh, he's done something remarkable and really important, um, and it has enormous geopolitical ramifications, and yet we get, uh, here's, uh, oh dear, where's the, oh there it is, here's the first headline, something about his girlfriend, his girlfriend's trying to regroup. Oh, my God, she's quite attractive. He's got an attractive girlfriend, and she's heartbroken because he's fled Hawaii. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, he, he misses his girlfriend. <laughs> Outpouring of love from Russian girls. I don't see anything here about, you know, who exactly is going to get arrested at the NSA for spying on people illegally. Uh, nobody's doing this, but we do hope. There are a few good outlets. The Atlantic Wire, um, I actually think, is a pretty good website. Uh, the Atlantic Magazine is a classic, uh, old school, very solid magazine. Uh, so when I went to the Atlantic to see um, what they were saying, it's, uh, the world is rooting for an Edward Snowden and a Chapman romance. Um, Anna Chapman was a Russian spy who got kicked out of America or something like this, and is, um, again, an attractive girl. So therefore, uh, this is suddenly news. Um, this is just one example, and it, it may be unfair to just pick out specific headlines, but my point is, overwhelmingly, the coverage of these issues has focused way too much on particular personalities and the drama um, around the human interest story, which is a legitimate story, a small part of the whole thing. Uh, you know, what is, what is Julian Assange eating there in the Ecuadorian embassy? Um, it's just complete nonsense. We live in serious times, and, and we deserve serious journalism. And so the question I've had is, is it possible to fix things? Um, and, and what is our role in all of this? Well, Wikipedia is good at this sort of thing. Uh, as a general rule, we, we focus on avoiding tabloid nonsense and getting to the important facts. Um, if you go and you read the Wikipedia entry on Edward Snowden, um, it will mention in a couple of lines something that he had a girlfriend and uh, that's all. Our, our main lead headline is not Edward Snowden, who's he dating now? 
Uh, and that is something that we're really good at. And I actually think it's one of the reasons Wikipedia is so popular. People know when there's a big story in the news and you really just want to get some really good, solid background information, Wikipedia is a good place to go for that. Um, and I think we can and should redouble our efforts uh, in this area. We should really uh, go back and look at a lot of our articles and say, are we doing as good a job as we can at covering serious, real information that the public wants to know, um, or are we accidentally, just because it's very easy to do, following uh, the journalistic trends of the day uh, and, and deciding that something is uh, notable or not notable based on counting the number of hits in Google News, uh, which is almost always a mistake. Uh, what we really need to do is use editorial judgment to say, what really matters? What is it that people really need to know about Edward Snowden? And it's probably not that his girlfriend was a dancer. Uh, that's probably not what we really should be focusing on. And we don't, of course. Um, but what's interesting to me is that if a bunch of volunteers like us can do it, there has to be a way for the press. There has to be a way for serious press to exist, even in the current degraded environment. So, this is not an announcement. I almost didn't want to talk about this topic because I've been working on something and I was afraid if I talked about it, it would be viewed as an announcement. So if there are journalists in the room who print anything that sounds like this is an announcement, next year I'm going to make fun of you <laughs> for saying I announced something. But I just took a three month, uh, no, sorry, three week sabbatical. I took three weeks off from social media, from editing Wikipedia. I went to my office. I actually blocked myself from Facebook and Twitter um, all day, every day. Um, and this is not an announcement uh, <laughs> yet. Um, but this is what I'm working on and what I've been thinking about a lot, um, is how would you build a serious alternative from the ground up? Um, what I'm really thinking about is what are some of the principles that we've learned about how to organize ordinary people uh, to do really amazing things? And I invite you to help me think about it. Uh, because I think it's one of the most important topics and we are the people who have a lot of expertise in thinking about how do you harness the energy of smart, ordinary people uh, to help improve the state of the world, to improve the state of knowledge. Um, this is my email address, jwales at wikia.com, so please email me if you're interested. What I'm hoping to do is start a little mailing list for people who are interested in this topic to just have an ongoing conversation, like what would the software look like? What would the design look like? Um, this is not an announcement. Announcement that I mentioned that. Um, it's an announcement of a mailing list. So I want to get a mailing list of people together to talk about and brainstorm and think about journalism. One of the things that's really interesting about the history of Wikipedia is that, of course, the first project was Newpedia, which was a failure. But the success of Newpedia, as it turned out, was for two years in the era of, of Newpedia, we had mailing lists where for two years a group of really smart people talked about how to create an encyclopedia. Um, and that turned out to be very valuable when we first launched the wiki because we already had a group of people who had given a lot of thought to questions about bias and neutrality um, and what should be covered and, and what are some of the ways of doing this. So I think it's really important. My view is the solution for journalism is not going to be uh, a purely volunteer effort um, in the way that Wikipedia is. The reason for that is one of the things about an encyclopedia article that's really great is you can, you can do it from your armchair. You can do it from home. You gather resources, you gather sources, and you, and you uh, study them, and then you write something good, and your peers check it, and you, and you discuss and debate how it goes. But a lot of journalism involves getting out of your armchair and actually going to interview people, going to find, uncover news stories and things like that. And that's really hard to do um, without a salary, without some means of support. So my view is that the right answer, the right way forward, is probably going to be some kind of a hybrid model, a model where journalists are doing journalistic things, but the community is uh, actually either equal to the journalists, which you've never seen in any newspaper ever, um, or perhaps even in charge of the journalists. It's sort of like, uh, you know, the minute you get a job, you suddenly work for the community instead of being the bosses of the community. So anyway, I've got a lot to think about. Um, I hope that you're all interested to think about these kinds of things, and uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be around, I'm sticking around. Uh, last year I had to, uh, I had a prior commitment that was scheduled a year before, uh, even, it was scheduled even before Wikimania was organized and I couldn't get out of it so I had to leave Wikimania early. Uh, this year 
I'm staying all the way to the end, uh, but my wife uh, is expecting a baby on August 19th, um, which is less than two weeks. Um, and so there is a small chance, a tiny chance, that I'm going to get the phone call and I'm going to have to jump on the next plane out of Hong Kong. Other than that, I'm going to be around and I would love to chat with anybody about the state of journalism because I've got a lot of thoughts whirring in my head and I want to hear your thoughts as well. Um, but now what I want to run for you is a, a short piece of uh, journalism, actually. Um, I've got a little short video to show you and uh, we can roll video. Sue Gardner has been executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation since 2007. Who is Sue Gardner? Uh, Sue is unfortunately the outgoing executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, she's been with us uh, for several years now um, and has taken us from being an incredibly tiny organization to uh, the amazing organization that we have today. So I, I guess I'm, I'm part of this, you know, small, crafty generation of Wikipedians who uh, sort of knew the foundation and had been involved in the foundation before before Sue was. And I mean, the organization is, and the movement for that matter, are you know, almost almost unrecognizable uh, now. So I think people take Wikimedia for granted now as this thing that is big in the world and works. Um, that wasn't true when she joined the foundation. She uh, came to us at a period of time when the website was successful, the community was successful, but the Wikimedia Foundation was in absolute uh, shambles. In fact, I would, I would almost look over to say that it barely existed. When we first met Sue um, in New York for her job interview, both Kat and me met with a woman who had in front of her a binder with all the details of all the things that happened to the very small foundation at that point. Um, referencing Foundation L and every other possible outlet for news on Wikipedia and, and Wikimedia as a whole. And she was incredibly prepared and she sort of blew us away in the fact that this is, if you, this is how you prepare for a job interview, it'd be very interesting to see how you prepare for the job itself. And she takes that approach to everything she does, really wanting to find out everything about it and then is able to talk to you like a peer no matter what your, uh, what your focus is. I first met Sue Gardner at Wikimania Taiwan. It was her first Wikimania. Um, she had just started at the foundation. And I remember meeting her and, um, you know, she wasn't, she didn't seem quite sure about what she had gotten into. <laughs> the first time I met Sue was at a meetup in Toronto, Ontario. And she came to meet Wikimedians far, far and wide who had come to visit her, including a few people who were just coming to see what the movement was about. And one of the first things that she did was take a few moments to recognize the work of Simon Pulsifer. And many Wikimedians know Simon, but he is the first person to have done 100,000 edits on Wikipedia. And it was very meaningful to see her recognizing not just a contributor, but somebody who had contributed long before she had started working with the foundation. She was interested in how the Quakers uh, work on consensus methods, um, how the Quakers come to consensus in, in small groups um, around big issues. And um, this wasn't something that either one of us knew anything about, but she asked me if I wanted to get involved. And so we spent this week um, working with this Quaker community. She spoke out about the gender gap which meant a lot to me because I was a female and somebody who was very dedicated to the movement and probably began seeing the issue around the same time as she was as something that was significant. Um, the fact that she did speak out about this and has on multiple occasions really meant a lot to me personally and that, that she took an interest in this and was willing to use her, um, her stage, I guess, to continue to address it. Working with Sue is sometimes uh, a little intimidating because her level of preparedness is incredible and it always makes you wonder, should I know more, even though you might very well be very well prepared for a meeting? The, the way I'd summarize it is uh, intimidating in a good way. Uh, it is constantly scary to uh, have Sue ask you uh, your opinion, uh, not because she's a scary person, but because there are nine times out of ten, uh, she's spent more time thinking about the problem than you have. Uh, Sue is an incredibly direct, uh, straightforward person. Uh, you always know what she's thinking, and if you don't, you just ask her and she tells you. She has an amazing recall for detail, and so you never really know 
when she's going to come back and look for an answer to something that she asked you in passing six weeks ago, but she hasn't forgotten. So you're always pushed to, to remember all the details, to remember what you're doing, um, and to stay on top of it, because the last thing you want is for her to know more about your issue than you do. I think her biggest accomplishment is providing us with a stable technical environment. Uh, we know that our work is not going to disappear. We know that the servers are going to keep running. We have the financial support to be able to continue to do that and to improve the software so that the frontline editors can do their job. To join a, an organization of three people with a couple of desks in a strip mall in St. Petersburg, Florida, and to see this, um, this vision of what we could be now, um, and then to set about making it happen, to get us from $4 million a year to $50 million a year in a very short period of time, move us to San Francisco, um, get a strategic plan in place, and take this organization that was really sort of floundering and point it in a direction. She always anticipated the next step. Like, and building it from an organization that is like eight people sitting in a dark alley somewhere in some creepy part in, of San Francisco, building it towards like where we are now, like having an organization that really can get some things accomplished. The different departments, um, the very strong uh, development uh, department, tech department, um, that's, that's, uh, that's I think the, the biggest accomplishment. So you should be walking away feeling happy and proud um, of, you know, she really actually built this, this structure that's working and functioning. Um, and, and she did it with, um, with a lot of style. I think a lot of people could have seen that uh, the organization needed to expand, uh, that we needed more people, more resources. Um, I don't think that most of those people could have not only seen that we need to expand and, and made us do so, but let us keep a coherent sense of who we were and what ideals and values we stood for when we went from a team of you know, 10 people to over 140 in a very short space of time. It's a, it's a you know, unimaginably different, unimaginably more effective, unimaginably uh, you know, transformed from, from what it was before. I think Sue has been the perfect person to lead the foundation over the last five or six years. And I think she's been the perfect person for our mission and our movement and what we need. And I'm incredibly happy that we've been blessed with her energy and time. And I think we've been really lucky. Uh, so I just want to thank her um, and say that I think it's amazing how perfect she's been for us. Sue, um, for everything you've done up to this point and everything you will continue to do uh, for the open movement in the coming years, a big, large thank you. Thank you, Sue, for all of your hard work and dedication to the Wikimedia movement. Thank you, Sue. It's been wonderful to work with you. Thank you, Sue, so much for joining the Foundation. Thank you, Sue. It's been a genuine pleasure working with you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue, very much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Sue, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Sue, thank you so much. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are today without you. I'm Jonathan Curiel for Wiki News. I'd like to invite the rest of the board and the senior staff of the foundation. I'm just gonna say a couple things. My name is Gail Young. I'm the Chief Talent and Culture Officer of the Wikimedia Foundation. And um, to Sue, on behalf of the foundation and the board for all your tireless work, just wanna say thank you. It has been our great honor. And from the staff, you have hired every single one of us and given us the opportunity to do meaningful work on behalf of this movement and this community that we love. And so thank you for that.
Okay, so that was a great video. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking later in the conference, and so I'm not going to talk now. I'm just going to say one thing, which is, as always, Oliver Keys says it best, right? So that was some kind of CV video for me that is, <laughs> I don't know what, but I'm going to change the, uh, the subject line on my blog, which currently says, imagine a world in which I update this blog regularly. I'm going to change it to say, intimidating in a good way. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Oops. So our, oh, our guest speakers and Jimmy Wells is really good at timekeeping. So, so I have 15 minutes to entertain you. So I will let the... I don't think I can take up that task. Uh, so I will let you go to the coffee break. But I'm not sure the, the cater is ready because... He, he was told like the coffee is like 15 minutes later, so probably you will have to be in the sunshine. So if you're not a member of the press, um, you can go enjoy your coffee, hopefully. So see you. Uh, if you're a member of the press, you can leave it down, because we will set up the press quickly. So please be careful. Oops. Uh, the press conference will be immediately started here. So, member of the press, please stay here. 各位記者朋友，記誒記者會將會喺呢度舉行嘅，唔該。咁大家可以坐前少少，準備一下。咩？仲有啲水，攞你支。誒，攞支出嚟啦。Thank you. 